There is no reason why we should not have the same circumstances in three-dimensional space as we have, for example, on the surface of a sphere. It might happen that the angles of a triangle would always add up to more than two right angles, and that the excess would be proportional to the size of the triangle. It might happen that the distance between two points would be given by a formula analogous to what we have on the surface of a sphere, but involving three quantities instead of two. Whether this does happen or not can only be discovered by actual measurements. There are an infinite number of such possibilities. This line of argument was developed in 1854 by Riemann. He showed that all the essential characteristics of a kind of space could be deduced from the formula for small distances. He assumed that from the small distances in three given directions, which would together carry you from one point to another not far from it, the distances between the two points could be calculated. For instance, if you know that you can get from one point to another by first moving a certain distance east, then a certain distance north, and finally a certain distance straight up in the air, you are to be able to calculate the distance from the one point to the other. And the rule for the calculation is to be an extension of the theorem of Pythagoras, in the sense that you arrive at the square of the required distance by adding together multiples of the squares of the component distances, together possibly with multiples of their products. From certain characteristics in the formula, you can tell what sort of space you have to deal with. These characteristics do not depend upon the particular method you have adopted for determining the position of points. In order to arrive at what we want for the theory of relativity, we now have one more generalization to make. We have to substitute the interval between events for the distance between points. This takes us to space hyphen time. In the special theory of relativity, the square of the interval is found by subtracting the square of the distance between events from the square of the distance that light would travel in time between them. In the general theory, we do not assume this special form of interval. We assume a general form, like that which Riemann used for distances. Moreover, like Riemann, Einstein only assumed the formula for neighboring events, that is to say, events which have only a small interval between them. We may now sum up and restate the process we have been describing. In three dimensions, the position of a point relatively to a fixed point, the origin, can be determined by assigning three quantities coordinates. When the three coordinates are three distances, all at right angles to each other, which, taken successively, transport you from the origin to the point in question, the square of the direct distance to the point in question is got by adding up the squares of the three coordinates. In all cases, whether in Euclidean or in non-Euclidean spaces, it is got by adding multiples of the squares and products of the coordinates, according to an assignable rule. The coordinates may be any quantities which fix the position of a point, provided that neighboring points must have neighboring quantities for their coordinates. In the general theory of relativity, we have a fourth coordinate to give the time, and our formula gives interval instead of spatial distance. Moreover, we assume the accuracy of our formula for small distances only. We can now move on to consider Einstein's theory of gravitation. We will start by convincing ourselves, on logical grounds, that Newton's law of gravitation cannot be quite right. He said that between any two particles of matter there is a force which is proportional to the product of their masses, and inversely proportional to the square of their distance. That is to say, ignoring for the present the question of mass, if there is a certain attraction when the particles are a metre apart, there will be a quarter as much attraction when they are two metres apart, and so on. The attraction diminishes faster than the distance increases. Now, of course, Newton, when he spoke of the distance, meant the distance at a given time. 
he thought there could be no ambiguity about time. But we have seen that this was a mistake. What one observer judges to be the same moment on the earth and the sun, another will judge to be two different moments. We cannot therefore allow that Newton's form of the law of gravitation can be quite correct since it will give different results according to which of many equally legitimate conventions we adopt. But physical laws must be the same whether distances are measured in kilometres or in miles, and we are concerned with what is essentially only an extension of the same principle. We are therefore not going to assume to begin with that we know how to measure anything. We assume that there is a certain physical quantity called interval which is a relation between two events that are not widely separated. We also assume that events have an order, and that this order is four-dimensional. That is, we know what we mean by saying that a certain event is nearer to another than a third, so that before making accurate measurements we can speak of the neighbourhood of an event. And we assume that in order to assign the position of an event in space-time, four quantities coordinates are necessary. Taking, for example, our explosion on an aircraft, they are latitude, longitude, altitude, and time. But we assume nothing about the way in which these coordinates are assigned, except that neighbouring coordinates are assigned to neighbouring events. The way in which these coordinates are to be assigned is neither wholly arbitrary nor a result of careful measurement, but something between while you are making any continuous journey, your coordinates must never alter by sudden jumps. In America, for example, one finds that the houses between, say, 14th Street and 15th Street are likely to have numbers between 1400 and 1500, while those between 15th Street and 16th Street have numbers between 1500 and 1600, even if the 1400s were not used up. This would not do for our purposes, because there is a sudden jump when we pass from one block to the next. It is assumed that, independently of measurement, we know what a continuous journey is, and when your position in space-time changes continuously, each of your four coordinates must change continuously. One, two, or three of them may not change at all, but whatever change does occur must be smooth, without sudden jumps. This explains what is not allowable in assigning coordinates. If you want a physical analogy for legitimate coordinates, think of a large rubber eraser. Measure little squares on it, each of, say, five millimetres. Put pins at the corners of the squares. Two of the coordinates of one of these pins could be given by counting the number of pins passed in going to the right from a given pin until we come just below the pin in question and then the number of pins we pass on the way up to this pin. Say we identify our pin as five along, three up. Now take the rubber and stretch it, and twist it as much as you like. The grid will be distorted. The squares won't be square, and the edges will be curved. The plane, the flat surface, may no longer be flat. The divisions now no longer represent distances according to our usual notations, but they will still do just as well as coordinates. We may still take our pin as having coordinates 5, 3 in the plane of the rubber, even if it is twisted out of what we would normally call a plane in Newtonian physics. Measurements of distances and times do not directly reveal properties of the thing measured, but relations of the things to the measurer. What observation can tell us about the physical world is therefore more 